calling this paper Researching Pastoral Approaches to Witchcraft Discourse in Northeastern Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, so the area that I'm talking about is um, in particular the town of Bunya. That's where the interviews that I'll be reporting on here were conducted uh, in, uh, on the beautiful campus of the uh, Université Shalom de Bunya. So uh, that's, uh, my wife and I worked in Congo over a period from 1982 to 96. And since 2003, I've been traveling back almost yearly to, uh, um, to spend time there. Uh, my paper's maybe a little bit different uh, in the sense that I'm, uh, in the paper itself, I'm not necessarily taking positions. I'm just reporting on what others have said, what the pastors that I uh, interviewed um, have said. So in the spring of uh, 2013, while teaching at Shalom University in Northeastern Democratic Republic of Congo, I took time to interview a number of leaders of evangelical mission churches as an initial stage of an investigation into their views of witchcraft. This paper is an attempt to report on the results of that research. In an earlier paper, I noted my impression. Uh, this was a paper that uh, was at uh, uh, EMS uh, meetings in 2011. Uh, in that paper, I noted my impression that there are many believers in Congo who do not seem to live with any great fear of witches, uh, despite their insistence on the objective reality of witchcraft and their lively accounts of witches' extensive powers and hideous activities. In that paper, I suggested that this relative lack of fear, at least among some, might be attributed to particular practices of the Christian community. And if you want to read there, there's a note on that there. Uh, what, what I said at that point. Uh, this is not to say that all is well. For many believers, stories about witches still provoke fear and confusion. Nevertheless, there do seem to be some, especially among lay and ordained church leaders, who appear to be essentially free from the fears that one might expect to find among people living in a context where witchcraft discourse is a prominent feature of life. Not only do they not fear witches, but many of them also do not seem to participate in any way in accusations of witchcraft, and some are willing to approach people identified as witches with love and compassion. We've heard some stories like that already today. My goal in this paper, then, is to summarize what some, uh, what some leaders have told me about their approach to these challenges. What are the distinctively Christian practices at work in their lives and ministries that help cancel out the fear of witches and reduce culturally prevalent tendency to identify, marginalize, punish, remove witches from the human communi community. My initial data set for this, um, sorry, I'm forgetting here. <laughs> OK, so what outlook or practices promote these outcomes? Uh, my initial data set for this research project consists of approximately 20 hours of interviews with 14 individual church leaders uh, from what are often referred to as evangelical uh, uh, mission churches. In addition, on my first Sunday in Congo, uh, during my most recent uh, visit, which was just earlier this year, I happened to attend a church where one of the pastors on staff was beginning a series of, th of three sermons um, on the topic of witchcraft, a, a relatively rare event on, in the mission churches, but I just happened to land on the Sunday when he was beginning that series. I was able to, present, to be present for that whole series and also to obtain a copy of the nine pages of printed sermon notes, also a very rare event, that were ava made available to the congregation for, for purchase. So, uh, findings. Um, what, what did I find from this? Well, any approach to uh, pastoral care for African churches must face the fact that, um, and we've heard about this today as well, as Bolaji Idowu has stated, it is idle to begin with the question whether witches exist or not. The observer from elsewhere outside African culture may hold whatever theory appeals most to him on the subject. To Africans of every category, witchcraft is an urgent reality. Uh, all of the interviewees for this study would, would clearly have agreed on this point. Pastor Balija's first message in the series was primarily devoted to describing witches in terms that seemed to this Western observer to be virtually syncretistic in his adoption of the basic categories of local witchcraft discourse. 
He began with a fantabulous story illustrating the power of witches in human affairs. He discussed different types of witches, described various ways by which a person might become a witch. He also um, listed some typical activities of witches. All of this was perfectly in keeping with local belief uh, on these matters. In many ways, then, uh, Pastor Belija's sermon, his first sermon, seemed designed to reinforce rather than undermine commonly held convictions about the dangers of witchcraft in society. Um, so, uh, despite my initial impressions from his um, first sermon, however, it became clear from the rest of the series that his ultimate goal was to encourage his congregation to shake off the fear of witches and to foster the development of a set of practices that would reduce the impact of witchcraft discourse in the church family and beyond. Um, other conversations partners, the interviewees in the study expressed very similar outlook. Um, so how then do uh, these church leaders maintain their own confidence in the face of societal pressure to do something about witchcraft? Um, what theological praxis do they seek to encourage in the churches they serve? What are the patterns or common themes that emerge from the data being interviewed, being reviewed here? And so, uh, first of all, I want to talk about three practice-shaped theological principles. Um, to begin with, I want to note uh, three theological principles that find expression over and over again in the data. In the first place, interviewees all agreed that any power operating through witches has its source in demonic spirits working under Satan's kingdom. As one student of the seminary put it in his bachelor's thesis, the acts of witches serve the devil whose goal it is to work against, God, uh, against God's will for human beings. Uh, in the in interviews, Ephesians 6.10 was mentioned to support the idea that if our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but rather against demonic powers, then there really is no point in trying to identify or deal with human witches since our real struggle is with those demonic powers. I think that point was made earlier today as well. Um, second, these leaders expressed confidence in the sovereignty of God in the midst of whatever difficulties they or others might face. Uh, here is how one of the interviewees put it. Yes, witches have power, but they can only go as far as the limits that God has set for them. If God does not give, per, give them permission, sounds a lot like the story of Job uh, figures in here, uh, to take my life away from this earth, then those witches will only trouble themselves for nothing. But one thing is certain, we must put our confidence in God, who is the true protector. In any case, if you put your trust in Jesus, in this God in whom you have trusted, witches can do, do nothing to you, unless perhaps God allows it. But I know that if God does allow it, then this is not to knock you down. So we should not be afraid of witches, but keep our confidence in God, and it is God who will take care of us. Um, a third theological conviction often expressed is that the victory of Christ over all the demonic powers through his cross and resurrection renders fear of witches completely unnecessary. Uh, one interviewee admitted that before coming to faith in Christ, he, like so many others, was terrified of witches. This fear persisted for some time after his initial conversion, but uh, gradually he came to understand that, and here's a verse that was referred to earlier today, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Uh, 1 John 4.4. 4. Other verses mentioned along these lines were Ephesians 4.10 and Colossians 2.15. Now, it is supremely important to understand that, this, that at this point that none of these doctrinal positions is held in anything like a, a theoretical, simply theoretical way. These church leaders are often put in situations where their confidence in these convictions is put to the test and must be lived out despite challenges thrown at them. So, for example, on a given day, the very real question might be, will you actually trust the goodness and sovereign power of God and the victory of Christ over the demonic powers in the face of the tragic death of your daughter and the pressures coming from friends and loved ones who want you to determine the identity of the witch who killed her? And that, was, that happened to one of the interviewees. That actually did take place in... Um, experienced that kind of pressure and stood up to it. Um, 
At a retreat I attended in April uh, 2014, sorry, uh, two pastors told of being willing to put themselves and their families at risk by accepting assignments to churches located in places where, ch where witches were known to be particularly active. Their testimonies were very much part of a developing alternative witchcraft discourse meant to reinforce faithful living in the teeth of prevailing uh, social expectation and practice. Um, so uh, those are uh, practice-shaped theological principles, now some epistemological explorations. In addition to these life-forged theological principles, the church leaders who provided the data for this study make certain epistemological moves that should be noted. Um, in his second sermon, for example, uh, Pastor Balija deconstructed the methods used by customary chiefs to determine the guilt or innocence of suspected witches. Confessions, he noted, are often extracted under torture or some form of psychological duress or incentive. Nor can testimony to a person's guilt uh, given by other witches be trusted. He also debunked the various forms of trial by ordeal that are used and the validity of testimony of diviners. Uh, in, interviews, in, in the interviews, other principles of identification were challenged, like dream apparitions and the claims of some uh, Christian prophets, particularly in the revival churches, to be able to identify witches. So all of these ways of determining the identity of witches was being questioned. Uh, several interviewees agreed that in the light of these epistemological problems, there are far too many people who are innocent of any real engagement with the occult, yet become objects of gossip and are slandered, ostracized, beaten, and, and so forth. Um, none of this amounts to Western skepticism, however. Most interviewees, for example, thought that confessions, if truly voluntary, could be taken as reliable. Several had stories of individuals who had, in response to hearing the gospel, for example, admitted to one form of witchcraft or another uh, on their own. Um, it is nevertheless uh, significant, as uh, Steve uh, notes, that uh, Christian leaders are grappling with this kind of hard epistemological question. Thirdly, um, in terms of praxis, uh, welcoming witches. Beyond the theological and epistemological concerns raised above, other practices can be found in the data. A number of these practices have to do with what the leaders want their churches to do for those who are suspected of being witches or who have confessed to occult activity. For example, several of these church leaders advocated some form of exorcism, at least in some cases. But at least one of them also expressed a general hesitancy with regard to exorcism as a solution for even confessing witches. And the general consensus seems to be that leaders need to be fully aware that there are other possibly more important tools in the toolbox. Um, uh, if, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. If you've got more tools, then there's other possibilities. In several encounters with alleged witches, these leaders resorted to a call to conversion and to a growing walk of discipleship rather than an attempt at exorcism. Uh, at least one indicated that loud attempts at exorcism might be some, in some cases evidence of fear rather than in a, any real confidence in Christ and his power. Um, in addition, these leaders expressed an almost visceral rejection of all efforts, to made to made, efforts that might be made to determine the identity of witches, whether through non-Christian ritual experts, diviners, and that was really a no-no, or by turning to supposedly Christian means like prophecy or some alleged gift of spiritual discernment. So nobody wants to get involved in identifying witches here. Uh, at least two of them referred to instances uh, where, uh, sorry, at least two of them referred to instances where church councils had disciplined pastors who had publicly identified a particular person in their congregation as a witch. What's that? Three. Okay. Uh, one interviewee stated that it would simply be wrong to go beyond what a given individual was willing to confess. It might be right to ask suspected witches if they know why they are being accused, 
But if they claim innocence, the counselor has no right to go beyond that to look for any other basis of identification or accusation. Finally, these leaders suggested various ways of adopting what might be called a holistic approach uh, to both, both to people accused as witches and to their accusers, calling for a clear awareness of various social, economic, and psychological factors that might play a role in raising suspicion or leading to a crisis situation. One told the story of a young man, and this is similar to a story that was, I think it was John Jusu that, that uh, mentioned this. Uh, a young man who had physically assaulted his uncle's wife because a diviner had informed him that she was responsible for the failure of his business. His church rightly placed him under discipline. This interviewee, however, um, who happened to be uh, the, the, the pastor of that church, also visited, also visited the young man and taught him some basic accounting principles for his business. It was not long before the young man had bought himself a piece of land and built himself a house. It thus became obvious that the problem had not been mismanagement, had been rather mismanagement of income rather than witchcraft. Um, another interviewee said that pastors should be given opportunity to learn some basic principles of psychology regarding different personality types, arguing that a particular person's irascible temperament might lead to the kind of conflict with others that could eventually result in false accusations of witchcraft. Uh, several argued that pastors and other believers should not abandon those who are the objects of accusation or rumor and gossip, but should continue to show them love, the love of Christ in practical ways. Uh, one interviewee went so far as to indicate his willingness to welcome an accused witch into his house as a long-term guest if that was needed uh, for some reason, both as a concrete act of compassion and as testimony to other believers that Christians have nothing to fear. Uh, yet another argued that pastors ought to be willing to risk their own reputation, even their own lives, in order to prevent violence against an accused witch. And the uncle of the young man this morning did the same sort of thing, went to the defense of, um, of his nephew. So, uh, do I have one more minute? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, as, uh, just to conclude, as su suggested here um, earlier, the overall picture is not as rosy as one might think if all they had to go on was this presentation. Uh, this is a cup half full rather than half empty. But it is clear that there is still, sorry, it is clear that there is still a great deal of confusion and fear among people, uh, both lay, lay people and, and many of their leaders, uh, sometimes with terrible consequences for suspected witches. Um, I have not reported everything that was said by any means, and some of what was said in the interviews was, interviews was rather disconcerting, uh, yet I also find a great deal here that is encouraging and even exciting. My hope is to continue to refine this analysis, put it in a form that could be presented to church leaders in Congo uh, with the idea of eliciting further reflection and discussion uh, of appropriate practices in a developing pastoral theology of witchcraft. The ultimate goal would be to give church leaders the opportunity to, to develop a shared understanding of a positive pastoral practice with respect to issues raised by witchcraft discourse in their context. Thank you. Okay.